Number 10, Spider-Man Reign. Spider-Man is arguably the face of Marvel, and for some good reasons too. He's incredibly inspiring, full of hope, and is never one to give up. For all those reasons, when Spider-Man Reign was released in 2007, it was incredibly hard to see an old, tired, and torn down Peter Parker who had pretty much given up. Set 30 years after the modern Spider-Man stories with a retired old man version of Peter Parker, Spider-Man Reign's Venom has donned the identity of Edward Sachs, the aide to the current New York mayor, and has been quietly pulling the strings from within. He's recreated himself multiple times, became the new leader of the Sinister Six, and has installed a security system around New York to stop anyone from leaving. He has goons that walk the streets, he's a total criminal mastermind. But of all the dark and depressing things in this story, there is one thing that stands above the rest. Through the course of the story, we learn that Mary Jane, Peter Parker's greatest love, has passed away and he's been hanging on to this memory of her and that's likely due to the fact that he is directly responsible. Mary Jane didn't pass away because of a villain or Peter failing to save her. Instead, because of the radioactive spider that gave him his abilities, Peter himself was radioactive. Active. Through the years and years that Peter Parker and Mary Jane had been together and doing what you do when you're together, Peter's radioactive body had essentially given Mary Jane cancer. We learn this as Peter is hugging her decaying body and bawling his eyes out. It's utterly gut-wrenching. Number 9. Marvel Ruins Marvel Ruins is a story taking place in an alternate comic book universe where literally everything that could possibly go wrong does go wrong. Similar to Ultimatum for part one, it's best to just list some of the events off then get specific here. The Fantastic Four's spacecraft crashes into the Earth and Ben Grimm is left with survivor's guilt. The Incredible Hulk is not so incredible as the gamma radiation he experienced leaves him as a hulking mass of tumors and deformity. Thanks to the radioactive spider, Spider-Man did not gain the abilities of a spider. He instead developed an incredibly brutal mutant virus that left him with a terrible skin rash. And had him captured and quarantined by the government. The Scarlet Witch betrayed the Avengers to the government, leading to the Quinjet being blown up with all of them inside, and they all go to the grave. Nick Fury was introduced to the idea of um, eating other people by Captain America. Silver Surfer suffocates in space. Johnny Blaze just sets himself on fire as a stunt and goes out in the same stunt. And Magneto's powers go out of control in an airport, destroying everything. The whole story just leaves you wondering what you're supposed to do with your life right now. And I honestly don't know. I can't help you. Number 8. World War Hulk Near the end of the Planet Hulk storyline, the shuttle the Hulk was sent to the Sakaar in by the Illuminati at the beginning of the Planet Hulk storyline blows up, wiping out the Green Scar's family. Hulk reaches a whole new level of anger, which is directed at those who sent him here, the Illuminati. And so, he headed to Earth with his war sworn. He made a quick stop at the moon to defeat Black Bolt of the Inhumans, and when he got to Earth, he headed to New York City, giving the city a time limit to be evacuated, and when that time limit stopped, well, he defeated everyone who was left. Iron Man and the Hulkbuster, the Avengers plus their tower, the US Army, the X-Men, the Fantastic Four, Juggernaut, Doctor Strange using the power of Zom, who is one of the most powerful magical monsters in Marvel Comics, and the Ghost Rider, all while saving innocent bystanders at the same time. He then threw the Illuminati members he captured into the ring against each other, sparing them as he only sought justice. He was eventually sort of defeated by the Sentry, who he fought until they both reverted back to their human forms, which is when Bruce Banner knocked Bob Reynolds out. Number 7. Pepper reigns in an evil Tony Stark The amount of times heroes have actually had to take on Iron Man is staggering. I mean, you'd think considering how massive of a hero he is, especially now with his story becoming a worldwide sensation thanks to the MCU, that Iron Man would typically have some of his worst battles against villains, not heroes. But yeah, Iron Man has done some bad stuff in the past, which has meant that even his closest friends and allies such as Pepper Potts have had to turn against him. In this instance, Tony had his alignment reversed during the events of Axis, but rather than allow them to be flipped back, he instead remained a villain even after the event had ended. Tony saw himself as a superior version with no morals to hold him back, becoming known as Superior Iron Man. As such, Pepper was ultimately forced to take him down with the help of an earlier version of Tony who he dubbed Inferior Iron Man. 
Number 6. Nothing can tame Bruce Banner. Starting off Hulk issue number 1 with a bang, Donny Cates had Hulk face off against Iron Man in his Hulkbuster armor. Not just one Hulkbuster though, a whole entourage of them. Hulk here being piloted like a spaceship by Bruce Banner, who is in control of Hulk on the inside, even manages to learn that Tony isn't actually inside these suits, but is hiding elsewhere, remote piloting them. He literally learns this by ripping them apart, and then Tony is like, how did you know I wasn't in that suit? And he's like, I didn't know that. I'm crazy. Hulk then finds the real armored Tony and starts wailing on him. Even when Stark attempts to appeal to Bruce's better nature, trying to talk him down, Hulk does not relent. Number 5. Thor's Apocalyptic Clone Thor and Iron Man don't always get along, despite them both being colleagues and friends who are both Avengers. Following the first superhero civil war in the comics, the two ended up having some pretty big beef, thanks to Tony making some questionable decisions during that era. Chiefly, it was revealed that Stark had acquired a genetic sample of his friend Thor, I'm just imagining Tony like at the Avengers mansion or something, raiding through Thor's like hairbrush late one night for those sweet, sweet genetic samples. He's like, ha ha ha, I have his hair, I can use this at some point. And he decided to keep these genetic samples for a rainy day, in case he ever needed to make, let's say, a Thor clone. After Thor died, that's what he did, creating Ragnarok, Thor's bald and villainous clone who would end up being recruited to Norman Osborn's Dark Avengers. Needless to say, Thor was not too happy happy to hear of this upon his return to the realm of the living and ended up revealing just how displeased he was in a one on one fight against Iron Man, which went as well for Tony as you would probably imagine. After all, Thor is a god. Thor wouldn't kill Tony, but he definitely made sure to make it known that if he wanted to end Iron Man's life, he could with ease. Number 4. Black Panther Gets Creative Who is smarter, Tony Stark or T'Challa? Most people would pick Tony for this kind of versus, but Christopher Priest, Black Panther would say otherwise. In issue number 45 of the 1998 Black Panther series, Iron Man in a stealth suit faces off against Black Panther. This stealth suit was specifically designed for such a task, with Tony attempting to anticipate both Black Panther's offensive and defensive abilities. But what he can seem to prepare for is just how brilliant T'Challa is, with him demonstrating how resourceful, creative, and brilliant he is in his brutal takedown of Iron Man's stealth armor. Sneaking up on T'Challa, it turns out, is kind of always a bad idea. Number 3. Thanos Wins In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, technically one of the greatest defeats of all happened to Iron Man 2. This was when Thanos initially won against all the heroes of Earth and succeeded in collecting all the Infinity Stones and using them to snap half of the population out of existence. It was a wild time for us, and I'm sure the heroes alike. Iron Man learned that the heroes had lost back when he was left stranded on another world, the home world of the mad titan Thanos known as Titan. Not sure if he'd even make his way home ever again. He also ended up being one of the few people left alive after the battle had been fought and Thanos snapped. Iron Man was there to see his protege Spider-Man turn to dust before his eyes as one of the casualties of the events of Infinity War. Number 2. Black Widow Does the Unimaginable Black Widow majorly betrayed Iron Man in the Ultimate Universe. While she didn't defeat him at the end of the day, her turning on him came with a pretty great cost, so I'd still say it was a defeat in a way. And while Iron Man did ultimately win in the end, he himself was still standing, I would argue that initially Iron Man was seemingly defeated in ways by Black Widow who caught him off guard. Also sure, it's not main continuity, but it's honestly so bad it needs to be acknowledged and mentioned here. In the Ultimate Universe, Black Widow was only posing as a hero, but was really in secret a villain the whole time, simply pretending to defect to get in with the heroes and then betray them and the United States. She was engaged to be married to Tony Stark and ended up breaking off the engagement when she revealed her true colors. She attempted to steal Tony's fortune and tragically killed his loyal butler and friend Jarvis as well. Number 1. Thanos' Henchwoman Wins Not only has Thanos won against Tony Stark before, but in the comics, Thanos didn't even fight directly against Tony during the Infinity Gauntlet saga. He apparently had less respect for Iron Man than he expressed in the MCU. Instead of fighting Iron Man one on one, Thanos decided to deploy Taraxia. Taraxia was basically created by Thanos in his image to act as his partner after death rejected him. As such, Taraxia basically looks like Thanos but with a feminine shape and a head full of long blue hair. She was tasked with taking on the heroes at Thanos' behest and did so with great pleasure. When facing Iron Man in Infinity Gauntlet issue number 4, she brutally defeats him by removing his head from his body. Number 10. Eternals vs X-Men So, the Eternals are basically a celestial created experiment and an offshoot of humanity. They have an eternal struggle against another offshoot, the Deviants. Eternals have hardwired programming to protect the Celestials and to correct X. 
process deviation. Now, a recent revelation about mutants and deviants causes the new Eternal leader, a pretty sinister guy by the name of Druig, to decide that the mutants represent excess deviation. Thanks to that, war is declared on all mutants everywhere. Following their programming, Eternal assassins come to Krakoa to destroy the Five. Massive war machine Eternals called the Hex are unleashed on Krakoa, and Uranos, one of the oldest and nastiest of all the Eternals, is unleashed on Arako. Now, Uranos is only able to be released from his prison for one hour at a time. But within that hour, Uranos is able to take out every member of the Great Ring of Arako, all of which are Omega level mutants. Hell, in the first 20 minutes, Uranos arrests eradicated Cable, Magneto, and David Haller, otherwise known as Legion. He then goes on to wipe out about a million mutants. Number 9. Magneto vs Red Skull Now some of you may know this, but I think this is one of my absolute favorite Magneto moments. And he has a lot of good ones, so that's saying something. Magneto and the Red Skull are on opposite sides of history. Magneto grew up in a Jewish family living in Germany during World War II. And we all know Red Skull and Hydra's stance in World War II Germany. So it's safe to say that these two villains don't really like each other, right? In Acts of Vengeance from 1989, Magneto and Red Skull were actually temporarily united. But it's really important to note here that Magneto was unsure whether this was the Red Skull that aided Germany. So Magneto confronted him and Red Skull did indeed confirm that he was the original. Now it didn't take much for Magneto, the master of magnetism, to overpower the Red Skull, but unlike what you might think, Magneto does not take his life. Instead, Magneto leaves the skull isolated in a stripped down fallout shelter 20 feet underground. He removed the ladder from the escape hatch, gave him 10 gallons of water, took out his homing transmitters, gave him no food, no light, just water, air, and his own depraved thoughts. Number 8. Hulk vs Abomination Compared to their counterparts in the MCU, Abomination and the Hulk in the comics are basically like gods. Comic book Abomination is completely psychotic, and the Hulk is basically a god of rage and strength. So when the Abomination took the life of Betty Ross in the comics using his irradiated blood, he was not getting out of it easily. When they come head to head in The Incredible Hulk Volume 25 from 2000, it's arguably one of the best Incredible Hulk fights I have ever seen. Emil Blonsky comes walking out of the water and before he even knows what happens, Hulk is on him like shrimps on the barbie. The ground around them almost instantly becomes rubble. The fight travels underwater and through a dam, flooding an entire town, all the while these two green goliaths are in a close combat slog match. Then Emil decides to taunt the Hulk, which just makes him angrier, increasing his strength, and the Hulk absolutely pummels the abomination, laying on fist after fist after fist, causing minor earthquakes and leaving Emil on the edge of life with his brain exposed. Other than being just an amazing fight, this comic also really shows the relationship between these two on a level not really captured anywhere else. Number 7. Secret Empire. In Marvel Comics, there is a character known as Cubic, who is essentially a living cosmic cube in the form of a child. With the incredible powers of a cosmic cube, she can pretty much make anything happen. But when she was manipulated by the villainous organization known as Hydra, she created a Captain America who grew up being loyal to Hydra. Now this Hydra cap would eventually supplant the real Captain America of 616 and would organize the second superhuman civil war, as well as Chitauri invasions of the Earth. He got promoted to director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and influenced the legislation of the S.H.I.E.L.D. Act, which gave S.H.I.E.L.D way more authority. He used this new power to basically organize a Hydra takeover of America. Steve Rogers revealed himself as not only a Hydra defector, but the Hydra Supreme. He allied himself with the new Madame Hydra, took advantage of a global catastrophe to seize control of the world's governments, and helped Hydra make its move. Hydra, who had seriously infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D., began assuming control of key locations and taking out anyone who stood in its way, including Cap personally taking out Rick Jones, which is a shot that left fans and characters alike reeling and shocked. The reveal of Captain America as a longtime Hydra agent completely took readers by surprise and even a bit of anger. His vast history of being the one to do the right thing suddenly meant very little. 
Number six, time runs out slash the incursions. So during Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers run, these things called incursions started to happen, orchestrated by the Beyonders. Essentially, two multiverses would crash together, destroying them both. And the focal point for that crash was obviously the Earth. When the incursions started to threaten the multiverse, Namor the Submariner had a different view from the rest of the Illuminati. And during the incursions with Earth 4290001, Namor destroyed that Earth to save both universes and save his Earth. When the next incursion presented itself right after that, the Illuminati were going to just let it happen instead of destroying an entire alternate Earth. Standing against that though, Namor teamed up with Maximus the Mad of the Inhumans and then together they freed the prisoners of the Illuminati, which included Proxima Midnight, Corvus Glaive, Terax, the Herald of Galactus from Earth 13054, Black Swan, and the Mad Titan, Thanos himself. Basically, this is like the Black Order plus some insanely powerful additions, and they are very, very powerful. This group of villainous powerhouses were sanctioned by the United Nations to destroy the alternate Earths that appeared during incursions. Now, while Namor had planned to use an explosion to destroy the other Earth, Thanos, who pretty much took control of the group, led them in what was basically a complete and utter slaughter. And ultimately, that was for nothing because the incursions happened anyways, pretty much ending this version of the multiverse and bringing us the newest Secret Wars. Number five, Sentry ripping Ares in half. The Sentry is a character that deserves some more spotlight. The problem is he's kind of the most powerful superhero Marvel has. Obviously, that's debatable, but this guy has the power to destroy pretty much anybody in the Marvel Universe. He's reassembled his own molecules and taken out the Molecule Man, for example. He's almost too powerful to include in a lot of stories, but it's the fight between the Sentry and Ares, the literal god of war, in issue two of Marvel's Siege event that really left me sitting there going, did that actually happen? And it did. Ares in this story started on the Dark Avengers before redeeming himself and joining the good guys. He had been showing how awesome he is and he turns his sights on Norman Osborn, which unfortunately means Ares now has to face his friend, the Sentry. Now Sentry punches Ares halfway across Asgard and maybe two or three punches later, he grabs both ends of the God of War and rips him completely in half. Not only did it leave everyone on the page frozen, it also left readers completely stunned. Number four, the last Avengers story. In 1995, Marvel released the last Avengers story and with a title like that, being from 1995, you can imagine it's not all sunshine and rainbows, and it's not. Within the first few pages, the current Avengers of this alternate future and their base are completely wiped out by an absolutely massive explosion caused by Ultron 59. Now Ultron 59 basically then challenges the original Avengers to a final fight against himself and a team of very powerful villains. Now side note, the art in this comic is actually pretty cool, which unfortunately makes it even worse watching one of the most savage moments from this story. At some time in the past, this version of the Incredible Hulk turned evil thanks to an event that happened fighting alongside Thor, the Thing, and Hercules. The Hulk turned against his fellow Avengers, Wonder Man, Hawkeye, Mockingbird, and Tigra, who absolutely got it the worst. Tigra against the Hulk is not a fight you would normally expect, and this comic tells you why. As in her attack against the Green Goliath, Hulk simply grabs her and pulls her apart, just like Sentry did with Ares. Hawkeye and Mockingbird literally flee for their lives, while Wonder Man flew into a rage, and he and the Hulk had a slog match that ended up with Wonder Man detonating himself and wiping both himself and the Hulk from existence. Number three, disassembled. For me, a big thing that shows just how powerful the Scarlet Witch actually is would have to be the Avengers disassembled event. Wanda and the Wasp were just chilling by the pool when Wasp mentioned Wanda's kids. Now the only problem is that the existence of her children had been wiped from her mind. And when Wasp brought it up, it brought all those memories back and Wanda absolutely lost it. Several things happened next, with none of the Avengers even knowing the cause. For starters, Scott Lang Ant-Man lost his life when a previously deceased Jack of Hearts showed up out of nowhere and just detonated. 
While the heroes were trying to figure out what just happened, Vision also showed up saying that he was not in control of himself and that he is sorry as he also begins to detonate. And then Jennifer Walters, She-Hulk, began to get uncharacteristically raged and tore Vision in half. Next, we see Tony at the UN conference randomly start to act as though he was incredibly intoxicated even though he hadn't had a single drink. And he verbally accosted the Latvian ambassador and threatened him. Then, a whole invasion by the Kree just randomly came out of nowhere resulting in the passing of Hawkeye and then the Kree just randomly left as quickly as they showed up. All of that was actually Wanda Maximoff using her reality warping magic. It almost led to the superhero community deciding to put Wanda into the afterlife and actually led to her creating the House of M reality. Number two, Punisher Max. Punisher Max was an adult comic, and for a guy whose main thing is ushering people to the pearly gates, it kind of makes sense that this setting suits his character best. Removing the Punisher from all the costumes and the superpowers of the regular Marvel Universe and dropping him right into an America facing the early days of the war on terror, it kicked off with the CIA trying to recruit Frank, which sets off a violent political game. This Frank Castle was a veteran of the Cold War, running Black Ops alongside Nick Fury in Vietnam, and he is not someone you want to mess around with. Like, he lights out Microchip during the very first storyline just for helping the CIA to even find him in the first place. His enemies here are also much more threatening and kind of scarily realistic compared to anything that Earth-616 has thrown at the Punisher, with a big shout out to Barracuda, another former soldier just as ruthless and skilled as Frank is. Punisher Max shows the very real physical and emotional damage that Frank Castle's crusade would really cause him in real life, obviously with like a tiny suspension of disbelief that comes with the comic book. If you choose to give it a read though, just be warned that it is extremely graphic. And finally, in at number one, it's Craven's Last Hunt. Craven the Hunter's comic book tale seemingly came to an end in one of the most shocking Spider-Man stories ever. Craven's last hunt finally sees the hunter get the drop on Spider-Man. Sticking Spidey in the neck with a dart and then burying Spider-Man six feet under, Craven actually beat his adversary, which only a handful of villains can actually claim to have accomplished. Thinking Peter Parker is down and out, Craven weirdly starts to take on Spider-Man's costume, or at least a copy of the black Spider-Man costume, and he hunts down criminals. In an attempt to prove to himself that he's better than Spider-Man, he defeated Vermin, a villain Spider-Man couldn't defeat without help from Captain America. Unfortunately though, the whole thing still ends in tragedy for Kraven. Spider-Man digs himself out of his grave and renders Kraven's victory moot, but Kraven also had accomplished his main goal by besting Spider-Man. So convincing himself that he has no reason to now live anymore, Kraven chooses to defeat himself Permanent. Number 10, defeated by the Green Goblin. Probably one of the most brutal defeats I can think of that Spider-Man has suffered was his final, or at least final at the time, fight against the Green Goblin. In this fight, which happens in the Ultimate Comics in the Earth of 1610, Peter starts off already being run down after facing the Sinister Six. To finish it off, he also must face Green Goblin, who in this reality is a hulking beast, not just a deranged and evil man on a glider in a mask. Just when it seems like Peter is about to be defeated, even being unmasked at this point throughout the course of the fight, Mary Jane shows up to help, running into Green Goblin with a giant truck. Thanks Mary Jane. However, this wouldn't be enough and while Green Goblin would also seemingly perish in the end, so would Peter. Of course, both Green Goblin and Peter Parker would later return, but for Spider-Man, this return wouldn't happen for some time. And even when he did at first reveal himself to actually be alive, he chose to pass his mantle on to the new Spider-Man of the Ultimate Comics and Earth 1610, Miles Morales. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know that you love us by clicking that like button. Number 9, The Dimension of Spots. Oddly enough, one of the people who has been shown as powerful enough to defeat Spider-Man was actually the Spot, who most probably think of as more of like a goofy villain, and yeah, most times he kinda is. But during their first fight, he actually proved himself to be pretty powerful, even finding a way to get around Spider-Man's spider sense. This all went down in issue number 99 of The Spectacular Spider-Man, which was also when they had their first fight against one another. Spider-Man ended up being completely surrounded by spots, well, spots, and from the spot dimension, the spot punched and kicked the hero to the point that Peter found it hard to focus on his spider sense and detect where the danger was coming from to dodge it in time as it was kind of coming 
well, from all around him. The spot also discombobulated Spider Man by taking him into the spot dimension and throwing him through another portal, another spot, which led out to a brick wall. He left Spider Man and Black Cat with a warning to not bother the Kingpin again or risk being destroyed by the spot. Number 8 Spider Man Reign While he ultimately comes out victorious in the end, Spider Man is temporarily defeated during Spider Man Reign. If you aren't familiar with this story, allow me to explain. Spider Man Reign has been described before as Marvel's version of The Dark Knight Returns for Spider Man. In this story, Spider Man is an elderly man who was once a florist but was recently fired. No longer a hero after years ago losing his wife, Mary Jane, and with her, his motivation to be Spider Man, the city of New York has become a police state, controlled under Mayor Waters Iron Fist. Eventually, Spider Man is inspired once more to rise up, but at first, when he does, the mayor responds by sicking his Sinner Six on Spider Man. In this fight, he is joined by his old enemy, the Hypno Hustler. However, the Hypno Hustler is soon after defeated, leaving Spider Man to be unmasked by Craven, exposing New York City's hero as now an old man. At this moment, he is seemingly brutally defeated. Fortunately, though, it's only a brief defeat for this older. Spider Man. Number 7 Manucci. If you want to talk brutal moments in Marvel Comics, you really need to look no further than the Punisher. Now, Manucci is the head of the Nucci crime family, so yeah, she ain't really a nice lady. Before the moment I'm about to talk about, Frank Castle had thought that he had already neutralized the threat of old Ma here, and that's because he literally fed her to a gaggle of polar bears. Now, while they didn't finish her off, the bears did happen to relieve Ma of her arms and her legs. It was that action that prompted the hiring of the Russian. In the Punisher Volume 5, number 12, after taking down about 80, yes, 80 of her thugs, Punisher comes back to finish the job. 80 men were already obliterated, so no one was really willing to lend the legless and armless head of crime a hand as Frank burned down her mansion. She puts up a decent fight with no limbs though, which is kind of impressive. After she attempted to gnaw off his ankles, unsurprisingly unsuccessfully, Frank uses his big old boot, plus the muscles in his leg, and not so gently flings this helpless, horrible woman into the burning pyre that used to be her home. Number Number 6 Punisher Netflix Prison Fight The Punisher isn't just absolutely ruthless in the comics. When Punisher made his way onto the small screen in Netflix's Daredevil series, he gave us probably one of the most downright savage and ferocious cinematic Marvel moments ever. Taking place in Daredevil Season 2 Episode 9, Frank, played by the irreplaceable John Bernthal, found himself in prison alongside the scum that he absolutely despises, and thanks to the Kingpin's influence, he gets locked in a hallway with about 10 inmates, his bare fists, and some very very rudimentary prison tools. What follows is a solid two and a half minutes of absolute savagery and brutality as he swiftly ushers each of these inmates to the afterlife, leaving him bruised and battered and covered in the red vino on tap, and ready to face off against a group of officers in riot gear who come in afterwards. Knowing how the main Marvel Cinematic Universe shies away from anything not suitable for a 12 year old, this scene, and honestly all of the Netflix Marvel shows, stand out as something truly different and exactly what us older fans expected to see from someone as ruthless as the Punisher. Number 5 Punisher vs Wolverine Yes, the Punisher is taking up 3 points on this list and I think it's pretty justified. In the early 2000s, Punisher faced off with Wolverine in Punisher number 16 and 17. Essentially, the Punisher found himself in the crosshairs of Logan and he needed to buy himself some time without Wolverine getting in his way. To do this, Punisher blows off Wolverine's face with a bit of buckshot in Punisher number 16. Now, thanks to his insane healing factor, Logan is still standing with his face already starting to heal over his exposed adamantium skull. So obviously, that didn't really buy the Punisher much time. So instead, in Punisher number 17, Frank Castle makes things just a little bit more below the belt, literally, as he wiped Wolverine's gonads off of the playing field in a similar way to how he took off his face. But of course, even this won't stop the mutants, so Frank Castle resorts to even more drastic and kind of creative measures. Needing the means to give himself at least a day or two before Logan will start coming after him again, the Punisher uses a steamroller to slowly, but completely, flatten Logan, and then he parks it there and walks off to do his business. If anything, I, I think this is a testament to how powerful Wolverine actually is. Number 4 Alejandra Jones Alright, buckle up, because this one involves 
Adam. Not me, like the biblical Adam. In Marvel Comics, Adam has devoted himself to one day eradicating sin from mankind at any cost, even human souls. To that end, Adam took in orphaned children and trained them within a Nicaraguan temple to make them perfect hosts for the Ghost Rider. Now, with the Fear Itself event and the arrival of the Serpent, Adam decided that this was a sign to make his move and offered to free Johnny Blaze from the Ghost Rider. Adam awakened the Seeker and had him pick the new Ghost Rider among his students. Alejandro Jones was the one chosen and was immediately sent to battle Scotty, one of the Serpent's avatars. When she came back, Adam demanded that she destroy the sin in the other orphans, leaving them as complete husks. Now she obviously refused to do that, but in return, Adam made her an unwilling servant. Johnny Blaze, realizing that he made a boo boo, journeyed to Nicaragua to stop them, but Adam turned Alejandra's power into a massive explosion that encompassed most of the entire country, turning the citizens, all of them, into mindless emotional shells of the individuals that they once were. The only ones unaffected by the blast were Johnny himself and the Seeker. Alejandro was used to destroy the whole of Nicaragua. Number 3 M Day So we know that in the House of M story, Scarlet Witch altered reality in some rather big ways. But it wasn't as if everything before this didn't happen. Just no one could remember it. One mutant by the name of Layla Miller, for example, could remember the reality before, and she used her powers to restore the memories of a bunch of other heroes. Another mutant who you might know of by the name of Wolverine could sense that something was wrong with this reality. Now he and a few other heroes, including a resurrected Hawkeye, formed up into a team and put things back to normal. Now seeing as Magneto was now the ruler, it made sense to them that he was the one responsible and they went on to attack him. During the scuffle, Magneto had his memories returned to him by Layla and Wanda convinced him it was Quicksilver who urged her to do the whole reality warping thing in the first place. Place. Angrily confronting Quicksilver, who admitted that he would have let Wanda perish, Magneto made him perish. Wanda, who was thoroughly angry and pretty unstable, yet again, again, revived her brother, yelled at her not father, denounced Xavier, and in three words, no more mutants, she reverted reality. She depowered 90% of the entire mutant population, resulting in a huge loss of life. All this on the day forever known as M Day. Number two, Ultimatum. Ultimatum was supposed to be how the writers finished off the Ultimate Universe stories. Obviously, it didn't really work out. Out that way. Writers kind of just went a little haywire with the things they would do with a dying universe story. Basically, Magneto, who had been a pretty brutal villain in the Ultimate Universe so far, goes even farther during the mega event. Basically, after Magneto gains control of the Hammer of Thor and is manipulated by none other than Doctor Doom, he messes with the magnetic pillars of the world, flipping them on their head and sending weather into a frenzy. The biggest event was a giant tsunami called the Ultimatum Wave that basically put New York underwater. And brought a giant casualty list. Bruce Banner perishes, but the Hulk ends up living somehow, multiple X-Men pass away, the Wasp gets eaten by the Blob, who in turn gets his head bitten off by Hank Pym, Dormammu turns Doctor Strange into a squished ketchup bottle, and Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are sent to the afterlife. In a bit more of a divisive move, while the X-Men are looking for their fallen teammates in the wake of the tidal wave in New York, Magneto pays a visit to Professor X and in a pretty brutal scene, snaps the Professor's neck. In retaliation, the X-Men attack Magneto's fortress. Angel gets stomped and chomped by Sabretooth, and Magneto eventually rips the adamantium from Wolverine's skeleton and pretty much disintegrates him. And that's just the big stuff. And finally, in at number one, it's the fall of X. During this year's annual mutant celebration, the Hellfire Gala, literally on the very next page after the new X-Men team is finally announced, out of nowhere, the anti-mutant organization known as Orcus attacks the gala, with Nimrod coming crashing down from the thermosphere at terminal velocity. He completely obliterates Dazzler, Frenzy, Cannibal, and Prodigy, and then punches Jubilee into the ground, wiping out five of the eight new X-Men before he managed to decimate Bobby Drake Iceman, another Omega level mutant. While Juggernaut held off Nimrod, Jean Grey was taken out by Moira X, and Dr. Stasis revealed to Professor X that the medicine that the X-Men had been producing for the world that has led to Krakoa becoming a world power have all been tampered with, and Stasis can now control or wipe out 
any human who used any of the medicine produced by the X-Men. In exchange for him agreeing to not do that, Charles Xavier agrees to use his power to force the mutant population of Krakoa, some 200,000 strong mutants, to go through teleportation gates to the X-Men's home on Arako slash Mars. Now Orcus planned on having Arako being its next target, but instead, something went horribly wrong and 200,000 mutants were suddenly transported to the White Hot Room, essentially the afterlife and the base of operations of the Phoenix Force. Number 10. Return from the Dead While well, initially thought a goner after a run in with the poisons in outer space, despite the fact that Carnage literally fell to Earth, he somehow was able to survive this. Sure, Cletus was burned up and killed on re entry, with Carnage emerging to try and help save its host, giving its life for Cletus, who also, as I said, died, both of them gone. But at the end of the day, this brutal death wasn't even enough to stop Carnage from returning. Cletus's corpse was recovered by the cult of Null, who sought to resurrect him by returning Cletus to the world of the living through a small piece of the Grendel symbiote they had in their possession. Carnage was thereby reborn, returned to a sort of undead-like life, although completely conscious of what he was doing, and now psychically linked as well to the biggest bad of them all when it comes to symbiotes, the eldritch god of darkness himself. No. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us you love us by clicking that like button. It really does help. Feed the algorithm. Feed it. Number 9. Defeated his own offspring. Yep, you heard me right. Carnage is a father to Toxin. However, when Carnage learned that he was pregnant, he was actually less than enthused. Instead, Carnage became paranoid and disgusted by the prospect. Carnage is all about taking life, not making it. So to him, that was pretty unacceptable. And then there was the worry that like how Carnage is often thought of as being more powerful than its parent Venom, definitely if we're talking to Carnage, that's what Carnage is going to say, Carnage's offspring in turn would be more powerful than Carnage, which was something Carnage could not abide. Needless to say, Carnage became obsessed with permanently defeating its offspring Toxin, but while Carnage would win a fight against Toxin, he would be prevented from fully destroying this new symbiote life. In the end, Carnage's win would be of a more temporary sort, and Toxin would actually go on to mainly become a force of good and kind of a hero. Number 8. Possess the Silver Surfer I don't even know how Carnage managed this one, but hey. I mean, I guess both the symbiote itself and the Silver Surfer are like cosmic in origin, but still, it seems like something Carnage shouldn't be able to do as someone who is more known as being more of a street level villain back in the 90s. However, it was the 90s still when Carnage managed to turn the tables on Silver Surfer, who was helping Spider-Man to track him down. Silver Surfer did so, but was surprised when the Carnage symbiote jumped from its host, Cletus Cassidy, and instead managed to possess him. Thankfully, the Silver Surfer would manage to regain control, but there is a What If comic that imagines a version of the tale where this was not possible. And the ending to that story is honestly pretty brutal. Number 7. Loses his marriage Possibly one of the worst defeats is also not even a physical one. At one point, Mephisto ends up tricking Peter into giving his marriage away. Well, not really tricking him, and not really Peter alone, as Mary Jane was also one of the two to make this call, but it was still pretty brutal. Not just for Peter, but also for all of us readers. After Peter's secret identity was revealed, a hit was put out on him, but when they missed, they actually hit Aunt May instead, who ended up in critical care and was on the verge of dying. In a bid to save her life, Mary Jane and Peter traded away their marriage to Mephisto, having no choice but to do so if they wanted to keep Aunt May alive. And of course, we can't let Aunt May die, I mean, she's lived for so long, keep her alive. Number 6. Losing his hand and his wife This defeat comes to us from the very brutal pages of J.J. Abrams and his son Henry Abrams Spider-Man comic from 2019. In issue number 1, we immediately start off with Spider-Man fighting against a big villain and his army of semi-organic robot specimens. We later learn that this villain's name is Cadaverous. Almost instantly, Peter's life is changed forever when we see him emerge from the rubble with a badly damaged arm. With a hand that looks like it's barely still attached, to be honest. Black and blue from the fight. Mary Jane rushes over to him, encouraging Peter to run. But before either of them do, the battle finds them again and Mary Jane is insta-killed when she is impaled by one of Cadaverous's impossibly long claws. Or fingers. Claw fingers. Welcome to 2019's Spider-Man. 
Number 5. Losing his daughter One of the most heart-wrenching moments in Spider-Man comics for me comes from a very personal moment for both Peter and Mary Jane. This is like a brutal defeat that isn't even like a fight, like a fist fight. At one point, Mary Jane was pregnant and even seemingly gave birth to a baby girl. However, Mary Jane was wrongfully told that the little one did not make it, when in reality Pete and MJ's daughter was actually taken by Allison Mongrain, who was later revealed to be working for Norman Osborn. What Norman wanted with the child? Well, we'll never really know, as this was never really revealed to us fans. The only thing that was seemingly confirmed was their daughter's tragic fate, much later on. That is, if we can even believe what Norman says to be true, I personally wouldn't at this point, so I'm still personally hopeful that Peter and Mary Jane's lost daughter could still return one day. Although I don't know how that would work if their marriage no longer existed. Would that affect them having a kid together? Could they have never had a kid together? Does that get erased? Number 4. Got Your Eye Moreland actually is the one to feast on Peter's eye. This happens during the story Spider-Man The Other. In this story, Peter finds out he's dying and sets out to try and find a cure. However, not even the greatest scientific minds in the world, including Black Panther and Mr. Fantastic, can find one. He even tries to travel back in time, but that ends up not working out very well either. Moreland at this time was popping up just to say some cryptic stuff to Peter, like, be careful what you wish for, particularly when you don't truly want it. But eventually, the cat is out of the bag and so Moreland reveals himself and decides to stop speaking cryptically and start kicking butt. Which is just what he does. He not only beats up Spider-Man until he can no longer move and lays helpless in the middle of the street, basically a bloody pulp, but he also eats his eyeball. Yes, actually. Don't worry though, Peter would grow it back. This is comics after all. Number 3. Meeting His End Spider-Man actually died in the comics at one point, and not even when he was inside his own body. This happened when he and Otto Octavius, also known as the villain Dr. Octopus, changed bodies. Body swap. Peter did so unwillingly and ended up being tricked by Doc Ock into doing so. Otto hoped to prolong his life and thwart death by taking Peter's younger body for himself while his older body, failing, would eventually shut down. Surprisingly, Otto's plan actually succeeded. However, before Peter and Otto's body died, he managed to at least convince Otto to carry on as the hero Spider-Man in his stead. So although he lost kinda overall here, he won that small victory at least, so it's something. Number 2. Infected Something you can't really beat, at least not when it comes to the Marvel Zombies universe, is being infected. In Marvel Zombies, Spider-Man is one of the earliest heroes to be taken over by the zombie virus. This ends tragically for him as the hunger takes hold of him. He actually hurts those who he fought so, so hard and so long over the years to protect Mary Jane and Aunt May, devouring them whole. He does his best to resist, but unfortunately he is completely unable to and even ends up being one of the zombies who actually lives the longest in this series. So he has to sit with this knowledge for quite some time, which I imagine would really suck. Number 1. Death of Gwen Stacy I think one of the worst defeats that Spider-Man has ever suffered, one of his worst losses, especially in his own mind, is the death of Gwen Stacy. Losing her was one of his biggest failings. This one went down during a fight with the Green Goblin, widely considered to be Spider-Man's main nemesis. As they fought, the Green Goblin used Gwen Stacy kind of as bait. At one point, he tosses her from the top of either the George Washington Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge, depending on which version of the story we're talking about here. The original one, it was the George Washington Bridge, I believe. While Spider-Man attempts to stop her fall by catching her with his webbing, it's believed that it was actually the whiplash as a result of Spider-Man's move that resulted in her death, causing her neck to snap. We get that terrible snap sound effect. However, Green Goblin has stated before that it was actually the fall that killed Gwen, and that she was actually dead from the shock even before Spider-Man's webbing had touched her. Either way, Spider-Man still blames himself for her loss, even to this day. And to be fair, I mean, editors have confirmed that, yeah, Spider-Man kinda did that. But either way, she would've died, so it's not really his fault, because she's either gonna hit the ground, she's gonna die, or you're gonna catch her, she's gonna die. So, death all around. Starting off our list at number 10 is Apocalypse. If if it wasn't for his goal of mutant domination and evolution, Apocalypse would vaporize the X-Men whenever he wanted to, and even if that wasn't how he did it, he has the capacity to wipe out the X-Men in a whole handful of ways. For starters, Apocalypse is what is called an external. These are mutants who are immortal, share a psychic connection, and who can revive themselves, so he can just never be permanently taken down, and he has been around for about 5,000 years. Apocalypse's original mutant ability was to be able to control his molecular structure, but 
over time, with the mentality of survival of the fittest, he has enhanced his abilities and even gained new ones through the use of celestial technology, celestial armor, and at least two different techno organic viruses. He can do a lot with his molecular manipulation, including heal himself and turn his limbs into simple melee weapons, but also technologically complex weapons like plasma cannons. But I think the most impressive thing he can do is consciously and subconsciously grant himself a huge amount of powers at will. That makes him too much for the MCU already, and we haven't even talked about his celestial energy manipulation, his psionic abilities, or any of his countless horsemen of the apocalypse, all of whom were given power boosts by this unstoppable mutant. Coming in at number 9 is Thanos. Now before you come for me in the comments about how Thanos is literally already in the MCU, I want to point out the little fact that the version of Thanos from the MCU is like a schoolboy compared to the comic book version of Thanos. Thanos in the comics is an absolute monster. Monster. In the MCU, Thanos is fueled by an altruistic motive to help the universe. In the comics, he straight up enjoys taking people's lives. Thanos is essentially an omnicidal maniac. He's extremely prideful, violent, deceptive, malevolent, treacherous, and ruthless to the point that he doesn't care about sacrificing innumerable planets and civilizations, even his own race, in order to praise his love, Mistress Death, and gain her affection. Thanos also possesses an insatiable hunger for power, always seeking to obtain objects of incalculable might and influence, such as the cosmic cubes or the infinity gems. He does all that while speaking in a super sophisticated, calm, and collected demeanor, which they did get right in the MCU, I'll give them that. Not only that, but being a massive hulking Eternal with a deviant gene, Thanos is one of the most powerful of the Eternals of Titan, with an innate ability to synthesize cosmic energy, allowing for energy and matter manipulation. Thanos in the MCU is no pushover, sure, but comic book Thanos, he puts him Shame. Number 8 Zom. We have seen the character of Dormammu in the MCU. He was an insanely powerful mystical entity who Doctor Strange had to basically lose to a million times and trick to defeat. Well, it took all of comic book Dormammu's power, plus the help of the cosmic being Eternity, just to restrain the extra dimensional monster known as Zom, with the magical links of living bondage and the crown of blindness. And with these tools, these massively powerful beings only managed to trap Zom in an amphora, in a world beyond all worlds, in a time beyond all time. Well, when Umar, the sister of Dormammu, invaded Earth and Doctor Strange could not defeat her, he needed some way to put her down. The Ancient One told Doctor Strange about Zom, and Doctor Strange decided that he was going to unleash the monster to easily defeat Umar. Now, I don't know why the Ancient One thought this would be a good idea, because now, being free and not wanting to go back, Zom turned on Doctor Strange. Zom is so powerful that there was absolutely nothing that Doctor Strange could even do. Even if all the reality warping heroes and all the Avengers combined forces, they would not be able to defeat Zom. It took the power of the Living Tribunal, the representative of the One Above All and the judge of the multiverse, who had not even been seen in Marvel Comics before this point, to just whisk him away. The Tribunal then scolded Doctor Strange for summoning a being who could literally wipe out the multiverse. Zom has no other goal than to complete annihilate and destroy everything. Ever. Now, Strange has since channeled Zom in extremely dire situations, and that's the only time I could really imagine the MCU even mentioning his name. Number 7. The United States of Carnage While this plan didn't fully work, and it was only a temporary victory, Carnage still successfully messed up a lot of folks' lives when he took hold of a small town in America. He managed to absorb a ton of blood from a meatpacking plant that operated there, which boosted his power. Then he infected the water supply, turning the inhabitants of the town into his own playthings. He tormented them, making them do terrible things to themselves and one another, claiming the whole town as kind of his family. It was really messed up. In the end, the heroes do manage to reel him back in, but even then, he had some pretty big, small victories over the town's residents. Big in the sense of, to the residents, they'd be pretty big losses, but you know, to someone like Carnage, it's just like another tick in a box. The town's residents in the end also wanted him not just gone and arrested, but dead for what he'd done to them. So despite the heroes winning the day, the end of the tale kind of makes you wonder what a victory over Carnage really looks like. Because like, did, did the heroes really win? Because 
there was still a bunch of terrible things that happened, and there wasn't a lot of closure. Number six, the Avengers are Carnage. Not only was Carnage able to take over the whole town, but when the Avengers at first responded, Carnage was also able to take them over as well. Like the others in the town, he managed to infect them as a symbiote and even bend them to his will. That's how powerful he was at the time. So despite the fact that the heroes were pretty quick to take action here, it didn't lead to a swift and pleasant ending resolution thing. Just the opposite. In fact, Carnage also threatened to make them do unspeakable things should they try to resist his will or should he simply basically feel like it really. Carnage ultimately was removed from these heroes and they did end up becoming free once more, but for a while there, they were pretty powerless to stop him. It was pretty scary. Like, a carnage-ized thing? I don't think we want that. Number five, impersonated Eddie Brock. Cletus doesn't do anything halfway, I will give him that. At the beginning of the Absolute Carnage event, he decided to come back for Eddie Brock, not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally as well. His plan was to completely discredit Brock by ruining his good name. How did he do this? By impersonating him and getting himself arrested. Not only that, but Carnage then proceeded to eliminate various inmates who he himself was trying to get close to on his journey to amass codices, or codexes if you prefer. One such person is Lee Price. Since he had been impersonating Eddie while locked up, the murders he committed while in jail were also pinned on Eddie Brock, ruining his reputation even further. Number four, even defeat brings victory. I think one of the most wild things about Carnage is that even when he loses, he somehow wins. Case in point, the end of King in Black. Null is defeated, Eddie becomes the new King in Black. This event of Null coming to Earth was all something that was pretty much set into motion by Carnage thanks to his actions in the Absolute Carnage event. So what happens to him? Is he also defeated? Does he suffer for the pain he caused and brought in this event? No, not even close. I mean, he does, but not really, not long term. At the end of this event, instead of also remaining permanently defeated, Carnage and Cletus are instead reunited in death with each other thanks to the symbiote hive mind. Now I have some questions about the symbiote hive mind, but I'm going to table those for now. Honestly, I could do a whole list on the symbiote hive mind. If you want that, let us know in the comments. And I'm just going to accept this because this is Carnage and this is Cletus and together as Carnage at this point, it feels like they're completely unkillable. They just keep coming back. So very well. Number three, Return of Null. Even when he loses, he really does win. Case in point, the end of the Absolute Carnage event. It was here that Cletus gave Eddie the choice between the saving the world or saving his son. And it wasn't even really that simple. It was more like save your son and the world becomes like a victim to Null or don't and the world still kind of becomes a victim to Null. Cause it was like either Carnage was gonna wake up Null or Eddie was gonna wake up Null. But either way, it wasn't gonna be good. Pretty much either way, Null was just waking up and and it was just whether or not Eddie would be the one responsible for that. In the end, Eddie chose to save Dylan and in that way set up and was ultimately responsible for the awakening and the return of Null. This was truly one of the most brutal defeats to read because either way, Eddie would lose and Carnage would win, even if he didn't survive. And ultimately, it turned out he somehow did survive anyways, so whatever, I guess. There are no consequences. Number two, Ghost Rider can't take this heat. Carnage had a heyday during the Absolute Carnage event. He was defeating heroes and villains left, right, and center. Anyone who had basically come into contact with a symbiote in the past was a target. Carnage's goal was to collect all the codices which were located in the spines of all those who had even been bonded to a symbiote at some point in their life. This long, long list included Alejandra Jones. Alejandra, if you don't remember, uh, was also a spirit of vengeance, a ghost rider. However, by the time Carnage had arrived on her doorstep, she'd expended much of her power and was using the last bit of her reserves to basically just keep her village safe. And that's when Carnage showed up and brutally took her out. She was sent down to hell after her life was ended, but she did at least manage to return to get some final vengeance on Carnage and to protect the people of her village. So at least there's that, but still, it was a pretty brutal defeat. I remember reading it and being like, what? <laughs> Whoa. Number one, eliminating Venom. Well, okay, so Carnage hasn't completed this task yet, as far as I know, unless something has happened in the comics that I haven't read yet, and it's more building up to a boiling point right now, but he has eliminated many different Venoms and he's working on eliminating all of them, including the main one. Right now, Carnage's goal is to come for Eddie Brock, killing all the versions of Venom from across the multiverse, including that of the prime continuity one so that he might replace him and become the new King in Black. Because like, as long as Eddie exists in some form, he's kind of still the King in Black, it's a whole thing. 
go read the Venom series. That'll all make a lot more sense. Or maybe it won't, but at least it's explained. It's a pretty deadly game, but Carnage has been so power boosted since the days of Absolute Carnage that I would not be surprised if Carnage actually does win here. Honestly, the level of like magic story writing you would need to work to get Venom out of this one might actually be less interesting than if you just let him win here and then we see what happens next. But we'll have to see where it goes. Either way, time will tell if Carnage will fully or only temporarily be victorious, as he so often is with battles. Usually temporary win, but not long term. I mean, we hope. I mean, he's pretty unhinged. At number 10 is Deadpool. Although we're finally gonna see Logan and Wade finally team up in Deadpool 3, let's not forget Deadpool's tumultuous cinematic history as Logan's adversary. Remember that early incarnation in X-Men Origins Wolverine? Yeah, the one where Ryan Reynolds played the Wade Wilson without the mouth and therefore lack the iconic banter and charm that we associate with Deadpool today. Blame it on the 07 writer strike, which left many movies in disarray, but hey, at least we got the big showdown with Wolverine. I mean, that's what we all wanted, right? It's hard to deny that Wade Wilson's appearance in this film was a truly rough start. But thankfully, we've come a long way since then with a much beloved Deadpool franchise that has made fans forget about the dark days of that early portrayal. And I know Logan and Wade are going to team up and be all buddy-buddy in the new movie, but there isn't a chance that the two aren't gonna duke it out at some point in the new film. We're just gonna have to wait and see. Ogun is a formidable adversary in the Wolverine saga who possessed a unique and terrifying power, the ability to cheat being unalive. Initially, Ogun served as Wolverine's teacher and mentor, their bond akin to that of a father and son. However, their fates took a very dark turn one fateful night when Wolverine discovered Ogun's horrifying secret. You see, his ultimate goal was to gain the ability to abandon his own body and then possess others, granting him limitless power and everything everlasting youth. Wolverine, sensing the danger, fled before Ogun could execute his nefarious plan and possess Logan's body. Ogun's malevolence knew no bounds, even surviving a brief stint in H.E. Double Hockey Sticks. He once temporarily took control of Kitty Pride's body, only to meet his match by Wolverine's unwavering resolve. If you're enjoying this video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. I would really appreciate it. And so would these claws. At number eight is Rough House. In the gritty world of Mandrapore, Wolverine faced off against some seriously tough villains, and Rough House was no exception. This hulking powerhouse made his debut in Wolverine's 1988 series, causing chaos alongside General Koi in a bid for control over Mandrapore's criminal underworld. Now, Rough, Ho now Rough House's origins are a bit mysterious. Some say he got his powers from being related to Asgardians, you know, like Thor, while others think he might be a mutant. It's a little bit unclear. Now, despite their fierce rivalry, Wolverine has still stepped in to save Rough House from the clutches of the sinister Geist, who I'm pretty sure we're gonna cover later on. For Logan, experimenting on people is a big no-no considering his past, and he wasn't about to let it slide, even for a villain. So, in the world of Wolverine, even the most brutal villains can sometimes find themselves on the receiving end of a helping hand. Number 7. The Void Bob Reynolds was granted the power of a million exploding suns after consuming the Golden Century Serum, which was a much more potent offshoot of the original Super Soldier Serum. He has photokinetic based powers fueled by the sun itself that include molecular manipulation, immortality, insane super strength, speed, invulnerability, stamina, agility, reflexes, and senses, flight, teleportation, energy absorption, and blasts, psionic abilities, and even reality warping abilities within a small area. He used his powers for the greater good of all, and he was the example of what a hero should be. He had connections to Iron Man, was active during the years just prior to the Fantastic Four's emergence. He became a role model for Spider-Man as well as an ally to the X-Men, and equal to Reed Richards and a friend to the Hulk. The thing about the Sentry is that he is accompanied by a dark persona called the Void. The Void has all the same abilities, plus seemingly even more. The Void went on a rampage that took the lives of around a million people people and almost destroyed Manhattan. Full rosters of the Avengers, X-Men, and the Fantastic Four all went to take on the Void and they couldn't do a 
thing. Only the Sentry himself could really subdue the Void and it wasn't even permanent. Now later on in the Siege event, Norman Osborn used the Sentry to attack Asgard, but this accidentally unleashed the Void and it totally obliterated Asgard completely, taking out Loki in the process. Now this did actually branch off into a what if story where the Void was never stopped and destroyed every superhero on Earth and then went off to destroy the universe. The Sentry is basically a god and the Void is this god's devil. They may be adding the Sentry to the MCU soon, but I seriously doubt they will make this character or his opposite as powerful as they are in the comics. Number 6, Null. Null is the literal eldritch god of all symbiotes. He's their creator. Null existed before the current version of the universe ever even came to be in the black void of nothingness. One of his very first acts after he was awoken by the light created by the foundation of the universe was creating the all black necro sword. This was the very first symbiote and it was immensely powerful. Using it, Null was able to slice the head clean off of a celestial. For this insane feat of power, he was banished to a void where he worked more and more on the sword and eventually he broke free and went out into the universe with the intent of wiping out various gods until he was defeated and he lost the sword to Gore the God Butcher. And if we want to talk about villains who should have been more powerful in the MCU, he is top of the list. Null then goes on to make more and more symbiotes who all share a hive mind under the control of Null. They eventually rebel and imprison Null inside the symbiote homeworld Clintar, but he is one of the strongest villains Marvel Comics has ever shown us. He faced off against all the Earth's heroes and nearly won. He has awoken, enslaved, and controlled Celestials and even defeated the Sentry, ripping him in half and absorbing the Void. The only thing that defeated him was Eddie Brock's Venom wielding the unit power, aka Captain Universe, the protector of the universe, and the opposite to everything that Null represents. Number 5, Molecule Man. While attempting to fix an atomic power device, a trillion to one accident occurred, bombarding Owen Reese with radio and transforming his body. Now, this man, Owen Reese, was the most powerful being in the entire multiverse. The accident also caused a minuscule hole between Earth's dimension and another, allowing the being who would eventually become known as the Beyonder to become aware of a universe teeming with life, which would lead to the events of the first and eventually second Secret Wars. Now, Watchu the Watcher, who used to never become involved in the events of Earth, sensed the Molecule Man and the danger that he posed. He contacted the Fantastic Four warned them of the threat, transported them to face him, and the Fantastic Four couldn't do a damn thing to the Molecule Man, until Mr. Fantastic was able to deduce that the Molecule Man could not alter the molecules of living things. But that wasn't even a real limitation of the Molecule Man. That was just a subconscious limitation that the Molecule Man put on himself. The kicker is that, in reality, Reese's accident was caused by the Beyonders themselves. They created the Molecule Man as a singularity in every reality to basically use the villain as a device that would destroy its universe. The purpose of their experiment was to eventually destroy all the Molecule Men at the same time just to see what would happen, which was a key part of the latest Secret Wars event. But Molecule Man, being used by Doctor Doom and eventually Reed Richards, was able to rebirth the entire cosmos. Could it work in the MCU? Sure, it could, but the character would just be a plot device. I doubt they would actually use him as an actual villain. Number 4, Abraxas. Abraxas is the polar opposite of the cosmic entity, Eternity. This means his whole reason for existing is to destroy destroy all of the multiverse, which I'll be honest, there are a few different characters in Marvel Comics who exist for that reason, and funnily enough, a bunch of them are on this list. But Abraxas is also tied to the incredibly unstoppable cosmic entity, Galactus. Whenever Galactus would consume a planet, it would keep Abraxas in check. So when Galactus was destroyed in a story called Galactus the Devourer, Abraxas was released and begins his path of ultimate destruction. As a cosmic entity, Abraxas's powers are essentially limitless, and his whole existence is kind of important to the universe, which means he can't really be taken out like a normal villain can. So the question of how he was defeated is kind of important. In Fantastic Four, number 48 to number 50, we learned of an incredibly powerful weapon called the Ultimate Nullifier. It was used back then to threaten Galactus and stop him from destroying the Earth. Reed Richards ended up using the Ultimate Nullifier to essentially rewrite reality, remaking it so that Abraxas just never existed. Abraxas is so 
so unstoppable that we essentially needed a Deus Ex Machina just to defeat him. I think that if he was in the MCU, that's probably the only way they could make the story work, but I think it would basically break the whole MCU for them to do it. Number 3, Mad Jim Jaspers. When Captain Britain is sent to Earth 238 in Marvel Super Heroes UK number 377 in August of 1981, we are introduced to a guy named Mad Jim Jaspers, who is the Prime Minister of England in this reality. Jim has created a cyborg called the Fury that can adapt to anything like a sentinel can to destroy all the superpowered beings on this earth. But that's not Jim's power. We are being delivered this information from the inside of a teapot helicopter that is immensely bigger on the inside than it looks on the outside, with the room growing and characters appearing that are already passed away or that resemble Alice in the Wonderland characters. That's because Mad Jim Jaspers is a mutant with an insane level of reality warping powers. The thing is, this character is not fully in control of his abilities. Now eventually, we are introduced to an Earth 616 reality Mad Jim Jaspers who is way more powerful than his 238 counterpart. When Captain Britain pays him a visit, Jim uses his powers to make Captain Britain believe that he was dreaming and that he has woken up out of a coma. He then gets frustrated and wipes this entire reality clean to start everything fresh. Now I don't know what the likelihood of getting Captain Britain into the MCU is, with the multiverse becoming more prominent, it's more likely, but this insanely powerful reality warper is not someone who I expect will ever make an appearance anytime soon. Number 2, The Chaos King. Amatsu Mikubashi first appeared in Thor Blood Oath number 6 in 2006, and he is the Japanese god of chaos, evil, and an aspect of the cosmic being, Oblivion. Mikubashi ruled and thrived over the earth when it was nothing more than a formless void of primordial darkness. And as such, his goal now is to bring about a new age of chaos and void and darkness. He is a primordial being who was imprisoned in Yomi, the Shinto underworld, where he remained for centuries accruing an army of Oni, Shinma demons, and other monsters. Now, During the events of Ares God of War, Chaos King attacks Olympus after he had defeated and controlled the Japanese pantheon, meaning he had already done that and then he goes on to attack Olympus. And that was all after the fall of Asgard during Ragnarok. This is what kickstarts his mission in Chaos War, where he slays the Egyptian gods, the Celtic gods, Shi'ar gods, and the gods of Zen Law. He takes out Nightmare in the Dream Dimension, destroys Mephisto, and casts Mistress Death out of hell, making her literally run away, and releases the souls of the damned. He has the power to defeat Eternity and is practically unfazed by attacks from the likes of Zeus. God Hercules, Galactus, Silver Surfer, and Thor together could not defeat Chaos King. To win, this insanely powerful god of gods Hercules had to punch the Chaos King into a portal to an endless void of nothingness. And this was after he had already destroyed 98.76% of the universe. They wouldn't let Gore the God Butcher be as big of a threat to the gods in the MCU as he is in the comics. The Chaos King wipes out 90% of the universe. I just don't see it happening in the MCU at this time. It's just not gonna happen. And finally, in at number one, the one below all. In Marvel Comics, there is a character called the one above all, who hasn't really been seen all too often, but is essentially the equivalent to God, or the creator. Now we have gods like Odin and Zeus and Thor in Marvel Comics and the MCU, but this is kind of different. The one above all is like the god of everything. The supreme ruler of creation and compassion. It's even been represented as the writers of Marvel Comics at one point, just to give you an idea. So the one below all, as you can imagine, is the antithesis to this. The personification of destruction and hate. Another way of looking at it is that the one below all is the one above all's Hulk form, although that kind of makes things a little bit more complex. The one below all is trapped in the below place and manifests in realities through gamma and gamma mutates. Basically, this means that the Hulk and other gamma mutated beings have fractions of the One Below All's power and can be taken over by the One Below All for him to try and escape and destroy everything. In an alternate future, it actually does this, taking over Bruce Banner's body and using his power to devour the cosmic entity Eternity and eradicate all life in not only this version of the cosmos, but even going into the next iteration of the universe, ensuring that nothing in that universe will continue to be. Luckily, this is prevented in the Immortal Hulk story, but I'm telling you, 
Go read that story. The one above all and the one below all seem like beings that are just too conceptual that I don't know if they'd be making it into Marvel's cinematic universe. But the other part of this is that the Immortal Hulk storyline that features the one below all is way too graphic for it to be adapted to the MCU and Disney's brand. At number 10 is the iconic Joker removing his own face and then wearing it around like a mask like the loony he is. In the DC faces of the unalive and the unaliving of the family, sorry for that, it's YouTube, not me. Joker did something so bizarre, it left me scratching my own face. You see, he sliced off his. Yeah, you heard me right. He took a knife to his own visage and then proceeded to wear it like a mask. At first, I thought it was just a gimmicky, you know, shock factor move, but the more I delved into it, the more I realized the deeper connotations here. You see, while it would be easy to chalk this up as Joker being insane, this was actually Joker's deranged way of trying to make a point. You see, he used his own face, or I mean, lack thereof, as a metaphor for Batman's alter ego. You see, just as Batman's real face is the mask he wears, the Joker's mask is his real face. He was taunting Batman, saying, look, we're not so different, you and I. My mask is my identity, just like yours. Sure, the Joker's done some gruesome things, but this self-inflicted facial mutilation takes the cake. At number nine is Black Adam's brutalities. We all know how capable Black Adam is, considering he's basically Superman without the remorse. But there are two standout instances that really take the cake for me. The first is the time he lacerated Terra Man in half. You see, instead of a warning or a good old-fashioned beatdown. No, he rips Terra Man straight in two in front of the press cops. It's absolutely horrendous. I mean, seriously, talk about making a point. And if you thought that was intense, hold on a second, because in Infinite Crisis, Black Adam takes down the notorious Psycho Pirate. How? By jamming his fingers right through the guy's mask and into his eyes, pushing the mask through his face entirely. I'm talking about a classic Three Stooges move turned into a seriously lethal attack. Forget heroes don't unalive people. I mean, Black Adam doesn't play by those rules. If you're enjoying the video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. I would really appreciate it if you did. Thank you very much. At number eight, Damian Wayne begs his bomb to call off the hounds. Oh boy. Damian Wayne has faced some seriously gruesome moments. Despite his age, it doesn't seem to stop the writers from putting him through the ringer. One of the most shocking moments was when he suffered a brutal beatdown, got lit up with bullets, thrown out of a window, and then to top it all off, he was impaled with a freaking sword, all in succession. I mean, come on, that's some next level brutality. And here's the kicker. It was all on the orders of his own mother, Talia Al Ghul. Could you imagine that? Your own mom giving the green light for such a horrific ordeal. The most agonizing bit for me out of this whole thing was watching Damien desperately plead with his mom to call off the dogs. That's the most gut-wrenching part right there. But don't worry, you guys, tea got better. It's, it's comic books. At number seven is Romulus, who burst onto the scene in Wolverine Volume 3, issue number 55. He spun a tale of prehistoric origins, claiming a kinship with the Lupine a unique breed of feral humans tied to canine evolution. However, his narrative unraveled in Wolverine Volume 2, Issue 312, when Ramus exposed his falsehood, revealing Romulus' deceitful tactics. Despite his tall tales, Romulus possessed a regenerative healing factor akin to Wolverine's, granting him remarkable resilience. In their epic clashes, Romulus brought a lethal arsenal to the fight. His black gloves, which adorned four blades instead of three, proved formidable adversaries against Logan's adamantium Claws. Three of these blades mirrored Logan's own, while the fourth, a thumb-like appendage, added an unexpected twist to their confrontations. In this realm of thumb wars, Romulus emerged as the undisputed champion, making him a relentless adversary in Wolverine's rogue gallery. Number six is Razor Fist, a dude with literal blades instead of hands. Now, she may sound like a comic villain straight out of your wildest dreams, but hey, he's as real as they come in the Marvel Universe. Now, imagine this. You're Wolverine, the guy with the unbreakable claws and the super healing powers, obviously, and you've tangled with all sorts of baddies, but Razor Fist, he's a special kind of trouble. See, Razor Fist isn't packing any superpowers. He's just a regular dude with a serious case of Edward Scissorhands. The first time Wolverine faced him, he got thrown off a cliff. Ouch. 
But the next round, Wolverine showed him who's boss. Razor Fist even tried to tangle with Hawkeye, thinking that he could chop off the guy's arm for a prize. Not so good of a move, buddy. In a world of mutants and superheroes, it looks like sometimes all you need is a pair of razor sharp blades to make a name for yourself. And number five is Geist. Nikolaus Geist is a twisted scientist from the WW2 era Germany, who is a real piece of work to say the least. He aimed to make super soldiers for the bad guys, just like Captain America for the good guys. His guinea pig was a bruiser named Roughhouse. But then Wolverine came in, the ultimate hero, swooping in to save Roughhouse and freeing him, and giving a Geist taste of his own medicine by individually stripping away each of his own cyborg parts. Damn. Now the thing is, Geist was tougher than a cockroach. Despite looking unalive, he somehow crawled back from the brink. But life is cruel. Magneto, another mutant, eventually put the kibosh on him. So Geist's mad scientist reign didn't last long thanks to the unstoppable force that is Wolverine. At number four is Magneto. One of Wolverine's most brutal defeats was dealt by none other than the X-Men nemesis himself. In 1993's Fatal Attractions crossover, Magneto returns with the Acolytes to take on the X-Men. Now things got intense when Wolverine goes head to head with Magneto. Now this battle was iconic because the writers finally realized that Magneto's whole shtick is magnetism over metallic objects, and Wolverine's skeleton just so happens to be coated in adamantium metal. Now, until now, Wolverine had been letting Logan off easy. That is, until Wolverine gets too close and nearly guts Magneto. And so the villain retaliates by ripping the indestructible adamantium metal right off of Wolverine's skeleton. The metal is forcefully toned off of his bones and seeped out of the pores of his skin in an excruciatingly painful process. A jaw-dropping moment that left Wolverine on the brink of his demise. What's even crazier is that this was the very first issue where we found out that Wolverine's claws were actually bone all along. This iconic defeat had a huge impact, not just on Wolverine, but on the entire Marvel Universe. And number three is Silver Samurai. Silver Samurai, aka Kenichiro Harada, is a formidable Wolverine villain. He's not just any swordsman, he's a mutant with a unique power. You see, he can create a Tycon field and channel it through his sword, making it super crazy sharp. Think of it like basically a lightsaber, but even more lethal. In a 2020 Cable comic, Wolverine wanted to spar with him for fun, but Silver Samurai was all, are you trying to give everyone on the island a marker? Translation, he was pretty sure he could wipe the floor with Wolverine, especially since Logan recently lost to a younger version of Cable. So imagine a guy who can turn his sword into a weapon of mass destruction facing off against Wolverine. Showdown you wouldn't want to miss. Wolverine's healing factor might be amazing, but Silver Samurai's Tycon Charge Sword makes him a brutal villain who's a real pain to stop. And number two is Sabretooth. Sabretooth, aka Victor Creed, might not be the biggest, baddest villain in the Marvel Universe, but when it comes to messing with Wolverine, he's a real pain in the adamantium. Sabretooth and Wolverine are like two sides of the same coin. They both have those cool claws and healing factors that make them so tough to take down. But what makes Sabretooth so brutal is that he's not just about his physical beatdown. You see, he's got a wicked sense of humor and a knack for getting under Wolverine's skin. Imagine this guy showing up at your birthday party every year just to ruin it. That's basically Sabretooth in a nutshell. But it gets worse. See, Sabretooth once hatched a twisted plan to hurt Wolverine by putting him up against his own son. It ended with Logan having to do the unthinkable, to eliminate his own son to save the day. Talk about heart-wrenching. Sabretooth might not be the strongest, but, but he sure knows how to mess with Wolverine's head. And coming in at number one are the Mongrel. The Mongrels are a multi-crew with names that sound like rejected comic book ideas. However, they are actually, in fact, real comic book characters. But they also carry a dark secret that adds a layer of tragedy to their villainy. So let's break them down. We've got Shadow Stalker, Fire Knives, Saw Fist, Gunhawk, and Cannon Foot. Now, what truly sets them apart, aside from their terrible names, is their lineage, or rather their twisted heritage. You see, each and every member of the Mongrels is actually one of Wolverine's offspring, a revelation that only came to light after their individual demises at the hands of the very father they sought to torment. That's right, Wolverine unknowingly exterminated his own bloodline. Now, it probably didn't help that their shared mission was to turn Wolverine's life into a never 
never-ending nightmare. While their motivations remain shrouded in mystery, they pursued their vendetta by targeting Logan's loved ones only to meet their untimely ends by his adamantium claws. The poetic tragedy is that Wolverine chose to bury them near the resting places of their mothers once he had realized that they were his kids. Number 10, Civil War 2. Captain Marvel and Iron Man used to be super close, but then Civil War 2 happened and BAM! We are well past the events of Civil War 2 now, especially regarding relationships being mended, but boy, did this initially muck up the friendship between Carol Danvers and Tony Stark. Although more recently, Tony actually just tallied votes from Legacy Avengers members and actually elected Carol the new leader of the team. Healing! After the success of Civil War 1, Marvel thought a second Civil War was in order, but this this time, the motives behind it weren't quite as solid as the first time around. Carol Danvers believed the inhuman Ulysses' visions of potential futures should be acted on to protect humanity. In other words, Civil War II was basically Minority Report. Being down this road before, Iron Man tried to talk Carol out of this madness, but after Rhodey died when a prediction of Ulysses' actually came true, there was no stopping her. Ultimately, the event led to a one-on-one -on -one fight between Carol and Tony, with Tony being seemingly permanently defeated. Although this is Iron Man, of course, so of course he would recover. We can't we can't have Marvel without Iron Man, so he has to come back. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us you love us by clicking that like. Number 9. Hulk blames Tony Stark for his creation. This fight comes to us from Original Sin. Original Sin was an event where dark truths from many different characters' pasts were unearthed. In Bruce Banner's case, this involved him learning that Tony Stark was the one who basically caused the accident that turned him into the Hulk. Once he knows, Hulk becomes driven to end Iron Man, and while Tony tries to escape and defeat the Hulk, he ultimately fails. In the end, Hulk comes out on top, but despite Tony being badly beaten along the way, the two old friends were able to resolve their past conflict with Hulk's Bruce Banner realizing that what Tony did years ago, nerfing his gamma explosive, wasn't really that bad in reality. I mean, if not for Stark doing that, Banner probably wouldn't have even survived the explosion and wouldn't even have been alive today. That being said, if he had perished, he also wouldn't be the Hulk, which he kind of is like, I don't even know, should I even be here? But while he regrets his transformation, Tony berates him saying that the world does need the Hulk and that his being around is not inherently bad. That Banner and Hulk are needed and wanted in the world. Honestly, while the fights are epic, the resolution is also quite like epically touching here, I gotta say. I love the end of that when they just sit down and they're just having their little talk. Talk it out guys, sometimes you gotta Hulk smash it out, sometimes you gotta Hulk talk it out. Number 8. Carnage Cracks Iron Man I feel like one of the worst things you can do in a fight with Carnage is bring a symbiote into the fight with you. Bad idea. And yet this is exactly what Tony Stark decided to do in Extreme Carnage, Alpha, and Omega. He decided to get involved in all things symbiote when Null attacked Earth, infecting one of the symbiote dragons with Extremis to create the Extremebiote. But bringing this new organic suit into a fight with Carnage <laughs> was kind of a bad idea as Carnage took over the Extremebiote, leaving Tony completely vulnerable as he was of course naked under. Underneath. While he was beaten here by Carnage and ended up in the hospital to recover, fortunately, Agent Anti-Venom was around to ultimately save him from Carnage's wrath and help avoid any worse damage to Stark. So, thank goodness, but he still got his butt whooped. At number 7, pre-Robin Damien beheading a small-time villain, sticking a grenade in his mouth, and then throwing the whole thing at Tim Drake. Considering the last entry, we know that this guy's carrying trauma. Back in Batman number 656, Damien was introduced as a lethal assassin, hell-bent on proving that he's the only worthy successor to his father. Batman. He targeted Tim Drake, the then Robin, and Bruce's adopted son. See, Damien, raised as an assassin, thought that he had what it takes to be the Bat. But when he took on Spook, a kind of lower ranking villain, he definitely went overboard. See, he didn't just stop at knocking out the bad guys, he absolutely decapitated this one. Pretty cold. And then, to add a cherry on top of the brutal Sunday, he stuffed a grenade in Spook's severed noggin, and then hurled the thing at fellow Robin Tim Drake. Talk about family drama. At number 6 are The Hunters 2. From the pages of DC Animal Men emerges a spine-tingling and utterly gruesome moment that makes you question the limits of what can happen in the comic world. We're talking about the hunters using a man as their puppet. Picture this, a nightmarish spider-like entity straight out of a horror movie, seizing control over an unsuspecting poor man's body, contorting it into a grotesque, 
pudding-like human puppet. Huh, that's like Cronenberg-esque. This shadowy and malevolent figure have an eerie modus of operandi. You see, they remain hidden in plain sight, inhabiting human bodies, going incognito, and lurking within them like unseen predators until the opportune moment strikes. The Animal Man's narrative is certainly gripping, but I'd advise against chowing down on a juicy roast beef sandwich while delving into this particular story, because this mind-bending moment serves as a stark reminder that within the pages of DC Comics, the boundaries between fiction and sheer horror can blur in the most unimaginable ways. And number five, the Joker skinned a man alive. Now, we all know that the Joker's brutality knows no bounds, and one chilling moment that still sends shivers down our spines is when he skinned this dude alive. This nightmarish act was unleashed in his very own graphic novel, a tale that exists on the fringes of DC's canonical universe. Set in a neo-noir ambience, it depicts the Joker's ascent to power after his release from Arkham Asylum. The horrifying sequence begins when a former henchman named Monty foolishly hires Harley Quinn as a dancer in his club. The Joker, infuriated by this act of disloyalty, takes Monty to the darkest depths of cruelty. He skins him alive and then drags this hapless man onto the stage, forcing him to be unalive before a horrified audience. This gruesome moment, although not canon, is a chilling reminder of the Joker's unrestrained malevolence. It's the kind of raw, disturbing scene that would never make it into a PG-13 movie, and for good reason. What other nightmarish Joker moments do you think are too brutal for the big screen? Share your thoughts down in the comments below. Definitely not this one. At number four, Joker beats Jason Todd with a crowbar. The Joker, the ultimate thorn in Batman's side, has had his fair share of brutal moments, but one that still haunts fans is when he took the life of the second Robin, Jason Todd. He didn't just stop at a typical brawl, he went all in, using a crowbar mercilessly to beat Jason, and then he left him in a warehouse that was rigged to explode, reducing Robin to smithereens. Batman, in his unwavering pursuit of justice, not revenge, tried to apprehend the Joker, but the crown prince of crime at the time was acting as the ambassador to Iran, granting him diplomatic immunity, which meant no charges for the heinous act. The loss of Jason was a permanent scar on Batman's legacy, as Jason's resurrection brought on a new persona the Red Hood, a vigilante with a lethal edge and a strained relationship with the caped crusader. The Joker's twisted victory endures as one of the most brutal and lasting moments in DC's history. At number three, Solomon Grundy plucks off Red Tornado's arm. The Red Tornado, a unique character in his own right, had long yearned for the chance to experience life as a human with its sensations and emotions. His wish was finally granted when he gained a real human body. It was a moment of triumph, a chance to feel warmth and love he'd never experienced before, as he was formerly an android, but his newfound humanity came at a staggering cost. You see, Solomon Grundy, the hulking and formidable adversary, is not known for his subtlety or his kindness. In a moment of ruthless aggression, he seized the opportunity presented by Red Tornado's mortal state, and with shocking brutality, Grundy unceremoniously ripped off Reddy's arm as if it were nothing more than just an unwanted weed. The visual impact of this act was hauntingly violent, even by the standards of mainstream superhero comics. Freddy's arm dangled by a thread with bones exposed and all kinds of bodily fluid spilling, creating a disturbing and graphic tableau. It was a stark reminder that the world of DC is quite far from PG. At number two, Sobek chomps on Osiris. Now you'd think that comic books always end on a high note, but sometimes these inked pages are stained with moments so brutal you won't believe they happen. Case in point, the shocking twist in New 52's number 43 that saw Sobek, a seemingly dopey alligator man, convincing his buddy Osiris to ditch his godly form. And if you thought this act of trust wasn't going to end in complete tragedy, think again. Sobek goes full National Geographic on Osiris. He bites him clean in half. Imagine watching Animal Planet and the show takes a twisted go return for the worse. See, Sobek wasn't just a hungry reptile. He was a cunning, scheming backstabber with a plan. He was out to take down the Black Adam family from within, so the lesson learned from this jaw-dropping moment, never trust an alligator man, especially when it comes to your godly self. At number one, 
Superman punches his arm straight through the Joker. In the demented alternate reality of Injustice Gods Among Us, we bore witness to one of the most jaw-dropping and brutal moments in DC history. It all started when the Joker, that iconic villain with the penchant for chaos, hatched a nefarious plot to drive Superman to the brink of madness. He used a potent substance to trick the Man of Steel into believing that Lois Lane, the love of his life, was in fact the monstrous and destructive force known as Doomsday. But here's where it gets really twisted. The Joker, ever the mastermind, rigged a nuclear bomb to detonate at the moment Lois's heart ceased to beat. And tragically, that very same scenario unfolded when Superman, under the influence of Joker's deception, inadvertently took Lois's life. This plunged Superman into a state of profound grief and despair that defies imagination, as Lois happened to be with Superman's son. In a shocking and horrifying turn of events, a distraught Superman, consumed by grief and rage, crashed down to Earth, and in a display of unfathomable brutality, he plunged his arm straight through the Joker's chest, ending the Clown Prince of Crime's life in a cold-blooded act of vengeance. Batman, who had always tried to hold Superman back from crossing the line, watched in stunned silence, unable to intervene. This act of violence was no mere accident or fit of anger. It was a calculated part of the Joker's diabolical plan to break the Man of Steel to transform him into something unrecognizable, and it succeeded. In the aftermath of this brutal act, the once heroic Superman was shattered and left in ruins, becoming a tyrannical ruler on Earth, a shadow of his former self. 